Hi. Uh, today I'm going to talk on a topic I'm calling Synchronize Your Watches, uh, which is going to be in three parts. I'm going to talk about chronology, synchronizing times, how natural social times are getting synchronized together, uh, and finally uh, a rather complex notion but the idea of no time and how that developed uh, during the 19th and 20th centuries up until the present day. So let's start with chronology. Uh, we sort of all know what chronology is and it seems to be unproblematic. Uh, this is actually a representation of, a, of an art project which is uh, formerly in years BC. This is one of the more interesting pages. Um, kind of just goes through date after date after date. And we're used to thinking of history in those terms, in terms of a series of dates, one thing happened after another. Typically, especially since the 19th century, as um, Manuel de Lima has talked about, uh, we often think of temporal flow and we often tie that chronology to genealogy, uh, to genealogical trees, origin trees of one kind or another. Um, if the 19th century was the century of classification, as has been argued, it was genetic classification, arguing from origins uh, that really marked this period. Uh, so here's a typical genealogical tree of the 19th century. Uh, we then see humanity uh, in Heckel's famous diagram, humanity being part of a genealogical tree going from uh, Monera and Amoeba at the bottom right up to gorillas and orangutans at the top uh, with man at the very top. Uh, of course, this isn't the only representation of genealogical time. You see it all over. Um, and this is uh, Bart Simpson's version, which goes from simple one-cell life forms to um, brillo pads to um, athletes' foot and Limburger cheese. Um, but what we've got here is this representational form which takes over, and Manuel de Lima, who we'll come to in a second, has written an absolutely beautiful book about that. Now, it actually makes a huge difference um, what is at the origin of the tree and how you understand trees. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem with trees in a second. Uh, but i am just put this up as an indicative uh, image. This is the um, seed vault at Svalbard in Norway. Um, and the idea there is to preserve seeds of plants, uh, especially agriculturally useful plants, which might uh, fall victim to blight or pestilence or plague or all the other things that happen to plants at some stage in the future. So we want to have a vault, a bank, where we actually keep the seeds for future generations and future reference. Now this really is a question of what we might call in historians' terms the unit of analysis. What we are holding onto here is seeds. Seeds as the grain, as the point of origin. The way in which plant communities actually work um, is they're incredibly complex patterns of um, uh, patterns of microorganisms, microflora, um, microfauna, um, different kinds of soil. So preserving, choosing to to hold on to this one thing in the tree, saying that all it's about is the information. All it's about is the genetic information is already making a category error as you start to really think about what we should be preserving and how we should be preserving. But this chronological view, this view tied to the tree, tied to the single origin, tied to, tied to this ever march, um, ever forward march of history um, is, um, is a powerful and effective one in the world as well as a highly problematic one. Um, just take a second here for some theory on this. Um, Jacques Derrida, the um, critical theorist, the French critical theorist, actually Pierre Noir from Algeria, uh, wrote a lovely book called um, Archive Fever, uh, where he talks about arche, uh, the archive, that's initially the ark, as in the ark where the um, uh, holy relics are held in, um, um, in um, Jewish religion. Arche, he says, names at once the commencement and the commandment. This name apparently coordinates two principles in one. The principle according to nature or history, there where things commence, physical, historical, or ontological principle, but also the principle according to the law, there where men and gods command, there where authority, social order are exercised, in this place from which order is given. So when we start this kind of archive, like the archive, like the seed archive, like many other archives we have, what gets into the archive um, is um, 
under the commandment of the archive. So only the seeds get into Svalbard. Only HTML documents get into the web one way or another. Only documents in certain forms become acceptable. And so when you start a new archive, you're, you're both commencing a new, so you're saying from this moment on, this is where we recognize this archive, this is where we recognize this tree, this historical flow. Um, and we're also saying nothing that fits, doesn't fit into the archive really exists. That's the point of the commandment of the archive, the force of the archive. So we've got this tree form that we've developed, um, which is so significant chronologically. And it's one which has come under pressure um, in many ways uh, in recent years. Uh, here's a, uh, a more recent representation of the Tree of Life on the left, uh, a more typical one, by the way, on the right, uh, which is still being produced today. Uh, but the one on the left is particularly interesting. Um, first of all, it doesn't really look much like a tree, although logically it's in tree form to some extent. Um, it's actually unlike Heckel, who had man at the top, uh, note not woman. This has Charles Darwin at the top of the geological tree, uh, genealogical tree. But I want to draw a specific attention to what's going on here, um, where the root of the tree should be. And you see that there's these weird objects, the, um, um, the herpes virus, which I'm a proud owner of, uh, the tobacco mosaic virus, bacteriophages. There are things that don't really fit into the tree of life. Um, there are, we know that there is backward evolution in some cases. We know that viruses don't really fit in any single chronological genealogical story. So though it remains very easy to tell stories that way, it's a particularly false way of understanding history and understanding chronology. Uh, with respect to plants, uh, you can understand plants and animals, um, you can understand this by the fact that genes uh, through viruses can jump between species, they can jump between genuses, and they can jump between kingdoms. Um, and so viruses can move between plants and animals, for example, carrying genetic information with them. So although it's a nice simple story, it's no longer a story that we really believe either about the tree of life or interestingly about the tree of knowledge. Um, in the 19th century was this very single idea of the flow of history and the rise of, um, the rise of knowledge. And just as we're losing the roots for knowledge, we're losing the roots for trees. And here's a lovely demonstration by Manuel de Lima, uh, which uh, covers this. I'm going to talk today about the power of networks uh, and the challenge of mapping an increasingly complex world. Uh, and I'm actually going to start with the, the, these thoughts with uh, trees. Trees have actually been you know, really important religious symbols over the ages. Uh, we can see trees uh, all the way back from ancient Babylon to Judaism to, of course, Christianity. But even more than, than religious symbols, trees have really been important knowledge classification uh, systems throughout the ages as well, mapping a variety of aspects, mapping the blood ties between people, of course, mapping the main characters and stories told in the Bible, mapping also the main areas of science, and even mapping, of course, the species, the various species in the planet, and again, using the tree metaphor on and on and on. This widespread metaphor, it's so, so, so popular because it really expressed this human desire for order, for symmetry, for hierarchy, for simplicity, for balance and unity. Trees are really an embodiment of the simple way we like to look at the world. And one of the oldest trees of knowledge known to man, this was actually devised by Aristotle himself, this beautiful tree of knowledge that tries to come up with a universal structure for everything that we know across the world, you know, from, from living bodies, animals to humans. And this was considered to be the first tree of knowledge, but then, of course, we have grown a lot more uh, knowledge since then. In my view, we are really in this turning point uh, from trees to networks. We are really facing a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift in the sense that trees are not, no longer able to really accommodate the inherent complexities of the modern world. Yep, and so you're saying we're moving from trees to a rhizomatic understanding, so where things are connected, things are linked, um, but there's no longer a tree classification, there's no longer a single chronology in a single story. 
I'm going to move into the second part of the talk now. So keeping this theme of chronology going, uh, we're going to look at what happens, uh, what's happening today, both in terms of the this rhizomatic understanding of the nature of time and the nature of temporality, uh, but also in terms of new moves to synchronize world history and synchronize the history of the earth, the history of plants, the history of flora and fauna, and the history of humanity. Uh, one of the early examples of this that I know of from the, uh, from the 19th century is the famous historian Jules Michelet, uh, who wrote one of the first uh, universal histories. Uh, Michelet produced a nested three-world theory of human history. On the larger scale was the whole world, with France at its center, naturally. Um, nested in this, site, in this was the world of Europe, with France at its, at its center. Nested inside this was the world of France, with Paris at its center. At each of these worlds had synchronic and diachronic extensions. At each level, as you went out in space from the center, so you went back in time, and so you had a smaller scale recapitulation of world history. So as you went out from France, you go to India, which is maximally subject to environmental effects of race and climate. Um, and within Europe, he says, Germany was Europe's India. And within France, you would say, say Marseille, is the India of um, uh, the India with respect to Paris? So you've got this kind of idea that the world history really is working together. That there might be appearances of difference, but really there's one story going on, one synchronized story uh, for all of humanity. Now. Um, this chart, uh, which was produced by Adams um, in 1871, um, I'm taking this from um, a lovely book by Rosenberg and Grafton called Cartographies of Time. This is Adams' synchronological chart, which they claim, quotes, was 19th century America's surpassing achievement in complexity and synthetic power. Uh, what we can see here, and we'll go into, go into detail in a few minutes, is an attempt to bring all of human history together into a single story. And you can start to see how the different bits um, are starting to link together. It starts, oddly enough, but those of you familiar with geology will know why, in 4004 BC, uh, which um, apparently that's when God created the earth at nine o'clock on uh, Monday morning, uh, 4004 BC. He didn't like to start work too early in the day. Um, but it goes forward from there, right up to the present day. As it goes up, we start to see more and more linkages being formed between these separate branches, between these separate chronologies, producing essentially one single story, one single chronology. And that impulsive move to create a single chronology, to make all of the world fit into a single story, uh, is still very much there today. Uh, this is the example of ChronoZoom, which was um, uh, a Microsoft invention. The idea of ChronoZoom is that all world history, all planetary history, all social history, whatever history you care to name, can be put onto a single timeline, uh, very much like that um, formerly in the years BC book I told you at the beginning. So everything fits onto a single line. It just matters whether you zoom in or zoom out to, uh, to one line or another. So what happens? Uh, what's the current ideology, rather, as you try to really put everything, every human story, onto a single timeline? We'll start with human stories, and then we're going to move on to the natural world. Um, well, here's an example. This is um, a rather chilling example, mapping America's war on terrorism, an aggressive new strategy. Uh, and I'd like to point out a few things about this diagram. Uh, it's got uh, a dotted line um, around the center of it. Um, oddly enough, in terms of terminology, the functioning core, that is civilization, is outside of the dotted line. Um, and in the middle of the dotted line is what's called the boundary of the non-integrating gap. Um, these are places that have not yet brought themselves into world civilization and not really part of world civilization story can essentially be considered um, as not yet civilized. Uh, this is the kind of map, the kind of thinking uh, that led um, Bacon much earlier on to declare the possibility of a war in Mesopotamia since Mesopotamians were not really civilized uh, and George Bush to do the same thing uh, 
several centuries later with respect to uh, with respect to Iraq. Um, so the idea here is that we are all moving into the functioning core that boundary of the non-integrating gap will be solved. In this case, it'll be solved through military action, and you can see expected military action by the United States um, being marked here on the map. What's amazing about this map, which was produced very soon after 9-11 in America, is that it's an incredibly good map for um, internet connectivity at that stage. So you can almost take that dotted line which is there, and you'll see it reproduced in this map of the internet. So what we have is the idea here that as we create a single universal human civilization, a single universal story, um, we will all be in that same platform, the internet, we will all be communicating to each other all of the time. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, here's an extreme example before I, um, before I um, go into less extremes. Uh, the Human Memome Project. So the idea of the Human Memome Project, you've all heard of Human Genome Project to map the human genome. Human Memome Project, its goal is to map the memes which make us act well in the world and be well in the world. Uh, and the idea is that we will, um, we will follow those memes. We will, um, um, we will copy them and through copying them, uh, we will become, um, we will achieve health, wealth, wisdom, uh, whatever else goes um, with being part of, part of the, the new enlightenment. And this idea of copying of memetics, uh, absolutely central, for example, in the work of the sociologist Gabriel Tard uh, in the late 19th century, um, is very much one of using memes, using this principle of mimesis of copying to say, okay, we're all going to move into the same world. We're all going to have this single consciousness, this single um, move of world history. Uh, we're going to synchronize the world together. Um, and uh, companies, uh, for example, like Master Clock Times, talk about um, in a world demanding ever more precise, synchronized time. And this idea of synchronization happens at the very small scale. It happens in computers. Um, for example, stock tra trading is about to get 5.2 milliseconds faster. Um, what this is about is that um, Trading is occurring at such a fast rate on the stock market right now that the speed of light is sort of too slow. Um, and so you want physically to be closer to Wall Street, or you want to have cables which go a shorter distance so you can take examples, uh, take uh, advantage of these very, very minor temporal differences in order to, um, um, in, um, in order to um, synchronize with the world market uh, with maximal efficiency. So we're both synchronizing at this very, very small temporal scale, synchronizing our clocks, synchronizing our computers, and we're synchronizing at this very large scale. We're synchronizing the sweep of human history. And this is going, getting towards the crux of my argument, which is we're using very, very similar tools to do both of these sets of synchronization. So let's look at one set of tools, um, and this is bringing in the natural world as well. Uh, which is being used to synchronize. Uh, one of the great tools right now in um, the field of biodiversity um, is barcoding. Uh, and many, uh, several years ago, and this is the covers of Science Magazine and um, uh, The New Scientist several years ago, this whole idea of t barcoding nature, barcoding life, taking the images, um, using this technique, which was actually a business technique uh, developed in the 1960s, the barcode for stock keeping um, um, in, um, and checkout in supermarkets and inventories in warehouses, using that technique, that business technique, uh, with respect to life and understanding and cataloging life, using that business technique as well, to catalogue people to some extent, this one I call Euro Barcoded Man. Um, but you can see here, the, um, uh, this is an example from an old folks home in the, um, in the, in, uh, the 1970s in England, uh, where we see the patients in the, um, in, the, uh, in the home were actually being barcoded according to their uh, conversation, expression of odd ideas, laughing or talking to self, three times in the past month, typically stopping if reminded, which is more or less my problem. Um, but you've got this 
We use the barcode, and the barcode is a single technique which then travels. It travels across the world as we know it. Um, and ends up being an absolutely huge thing. Um, this is the uh, Barcode of Life project. Uh, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide because I think it tells us a lot about what barcodes are doing. Um, International Barcode of Life is the idea that we're basically going to create a single site where we have an understanding of what all of life is and how all of life fits together. So what's the purpose of the International Barcode of Life project? Life, they say, is threatened. Life is threatened with a mass extinction event rivaling, rivaling anything in Earth history. That's sort of true. We're, number, we're still number six at the moment, but we're moving up the, we're moving up the table of um, extinctions fairly rapidly. Um, life provides critical ecosystem services, such as pollination, nutrient recycling, food, and forest products. So you see here, life fits into a business. Life is providing a service for us. It's not that it's wonderful and joyous to be alive and oh, what a lovely day it is. It's like, what's, what's, what's life done for you lately? Um, and life is not that good a thing. Um, life causes major economic losses linked to pests and diseases of crops, livestock and humanity. Um, so that's, again, a real problem with life. I mean, I mean, we'd be much better off without life um, because the economy could run much more smoothly about it. So at the same time as we're using this barcoding technique, this business technique, and traveling that out across the natural world and the social world and the economic world, so we're conceiving of life to the extent to which it fits in with a universal and universalizing economy. Um, Life does have some nice things. It creates complex molecules such as antibiotics and enzyme with tremendous economic and societal benefit. Well, that's all very nice. Um, and with a bit of an insult to several thousand years of, um, um, of scientific work in many different cultures, it's largely unknown despite nearly three centuries of scientific endeavor. So the single move then, single economy, uh, we move it into the economy, we use the tools of the economy to manage it. Uh, Increasingly, we get this uh, with what's been called the, the Internet of Things or Smart Cities, uh, a single technology, a single way of knitting us in to a working economy uh, which will be universal history in the future. Uh, in this representation of the Internet of Things, uh, you see um, in the top right, you see plants, then people are next to them, these odd little counters of people. Uh, you see clocks and computers and devices up in the top left. You see factories and fishes. You see cities. Uh, you see bicycles. You see ships. Uh, you see communication towers. So the Internet of Things is going to bring us all um, into this single control and command network, and we're going to use that single control and command network with respect to each other, with respect to the natural world, with respect to the social world. Uh, so again, um, we might be moving into a, as in Delima's terms, we might be moving into a more rhizomatic understanding of world history and how things hook together and connect together. But by the same token, as I've shown in this part, we're creating a new kind of synchronization work as well. And that synchronization work is matching everything to the way in which the economy actually operates. So I'm going to take a step back in time now and look at some geological um, work from the 19th century uh, to understand sort of what's going on here um, as we move everything into uh, this single universalizing time and what the ideal or what one ideology of this is. Where did this move come from to integrate social and natural time? And I think some of the origins uh, can be found in the history of geology and the history of astronomy. And I'm going to start with a quote, which seems like a um, paradoxical quote, um, from Charles Lyell, uh, the great geologist um, from the 1830s. Charles Lyell is associated with a movement called uniformitarianism. Uh, the idea of uniformitarianism is that the earth was never young, it's never old, um, that the things that happened in the past uh, were basically caused uh, the, the same causes that operate in the present also operated in the past. Um, and so there was a certain flatness and uniformity to geological time. Now, obviously, 
so we start dealing with the Anthropocene, well, you think, well, that's, that's pretty weird um, because we seem to be terraforming and changing the planet very, uh, very fast. Uh, but Lyell, um, in the 1830s, the, um, what can be called the, um, the start of the period of planetary management, um, paradoxically, it seems, says that the changes that we have wrought, that we have caused, are not of a physical but of a moral nature. It will scarcely be disputed that we have no right to anticipate any modification in the results of existing causes in times to come, which are not um, conformable to analogy, unless they be produced by the progressive development of human power, or perhaps for some other new relations between the moral and material worlds. Um, so the moral world is where humans are. The moral and the physical world is where um, basically all the rest of life and geology is. In the same manner, we must concede that when we speculate on the vicissitudes of the animate and inanimate creation in former ages, we have no ground for expecting any anomalous results unless where man has interfered or unless clear indications appear as some other moral form of temporary derangement. So there is a single history to the earth, despite the appearance of progress, despite the appearance of change, Actually, it's all pretty much the same. And the way he gets through this is through this odd move where he takes us out of the flow of history and says humans are not really, really part of the flow of history and everything will go back to normal if humans went away again. He makes that argument very explicit at, at several points. Um, jumping forward um, 170 odd years, um, William O'Neill comments that we are the only important species, that's humans, that's considered external from its ecosystem, deriving goods and services rather than participating in ecosystem dynamics. So again, this idea that humans are outside of the flow of history um, is one that's been very powerful in both geology and, um, and, um, um, and biology for, um, for 150, 200 years. And as a figure, I'd like to draw your attention to here to who I find particularly interesting. This is Georges um, Poulet Scrope. Uh, he was a geologist in the 1830s. He was also an astronomer and a political economist, um, as well as being magistrate for the district of Stroud uh, in England. So here's a quote from Scrope. Um, first of all, time is really important and time really started to come to the fore um, as a theme geologically and astronomically in the early 19th century. The leading idea which is present in all our researches and which accompanies every fresh observation, the sound of which to the ear of the student of nature seems continually echoed from every part of her works, is time, time, time. So what is the nature of this time that he's seeing everywhere? Let's take a look at that. Behind apparent change, he argues, there is uniformity in human affairs. So here he is from 1833. The rules of political economy are as simple and harmonious as the laws which regulate the natural world, but the strange and wayward policy of man would render them intricate and difficult. So well before Fukuyama in the late 20th century, we have this idea of the end of history. If only we would stop being strange and wayward, if only we would stop being these moral actors, then we could become simple and harmonious in much the same way as the laws of, um, as the laws of geology were. So he goes on. It is strongly to be suspected that such epochs of general embarrassment and distress among the productive classes um, that's basically the working class and the bourgeoisie, uh, are anomalies, not in the order of events which, which flow from the simple and natural laws of production, but occasioned by the force of some artificial disturbing cause or, cause or other, introduced through the fraud, uh, fraud or folly of the rulers of the social communities they so grievously affect. So just as um, Lyle removes humans from geological history and saying it's a mo because we act as a moral force, not as a physical force. So the appearance of um, weirdness in human time, in social time and political time is caused by folly, it's caused by moral error on the part of humans. 
This was a common theme uh, in the 1830s. Uh, here's Poinceau, the astronomer, the Parisian astronomer in 1837. Uh, the regular flow of time, itself inspired by the watch analogy, was the central discovery of astronomy and thence of the human spirit for him. He wrote, in effect, we only know uh, completely one single law, that is the law of constancy and uniformity. It is to this simple idea that we seek to reduce all others. And it is uniquely in this reduction that science for us consists. Such, I believe, is the natural movement of the human spirit of which astronomy offers us the clearest example. So you see what's happening here is that already at this epoch of planetary management, this idea that we're starting to manage the whole planet, we're getting the idea that there is a single temporality which operates for stars, it operates for geology, and it should operate for humans. We don't yet have the mechanism to make it operate for humans. We don't yet have the mechanism to make it integrate. But if we look at the ideology, the, um, the political ideology, the Internet of Things and of smart cities, that's precisely what they're trying to do is produce this form of, um, produce this form of um, integration so that we have a single history which spans across the social and natural worlds. Uh, another quote from the 1830s, um, everywhere one, from Huo in this case, everywhere one sees such a uniform disposition that only differs in a few details, um, that pr often presents lacunas but never inversion. This order that one admires, despite so many traces of violent revolutions and upheavals and shocks that the earth has felt, does not it seem... Um, does it not seem, if one dare say it, in rapport with the reg regular march imprinted on celestial bodies? So in that first quote from Poinceau, we've got humans being allied with astronomical time. Now we have geology being allied with astronomical time. Um, and then we have um, this uniformitarian principle, this single kind of temporality, which is going to work for all of the social and natural worlds. Uh, we have it being tied as well. Uh, to humans, um, in the words of Charles Dun uh, Dunoyer in 1837, under its, and he's talking about the spirits of industry's influence, peoples will begin by grouping themselves together more naturally. Peoples will come closer together, mass according to their real analogies and according to their real interests. Given this, the same arts will soon be cultivated with an equal success among all peoples, the same ideas will circulate in all countries. Even languages will get closer. Uniformity of customs will be established in all climates, no matter what the conditions of nature. The same needs, a similar civilization will develop everywhere. And finally, the largest countries will end up by only representing a single people, comprised of an infinite number of uniform aggregations, between which will be established, without confusion or violence, relations both as complex and as easy, as peaceful, as peaceful and as profitable and as, as may be. So let's look at what, um, I mean, let's reflect on this, on, on, on this site for a second. I mean, what Dunoyer is saying, I mean, isn't this precisely what we saw when we saw the map of the war on terror? This idea that there will be a single human history that we can tell. Isn't this what we saw with the human Mimam project? Um, we are all going to copy each other. Languages can come closer because we're all going uh, to be speaking the language of the internet and the, um, and the um, language of social media. Um, we're all going to fit into this same um, into this same operation, and as we fit into the same operation, we'll basically come to the end of history uh, as we close the boundary, the non-integrating gap. So at the same time, as we've moved away from this, um, I think logically and very rightly, we've moved away from this chronological idea of the single origin of everything and everything needs to be tied to its own single origin. We've moved into this much more rhizomatic understanding of the way in which the world works. But on top of that rhizomatic and that beautifully rhizomatic way of understanding the way in which the world works, 
we've actually moved towards creating this single supervenient universal history which will be the history of the earth. It will be the history of nature because the history of nature, the history of the earth will fit in um, with the economy, uh, the political economy that we are creating. And so the same moves that we saw um, from the early 19th century, then that impulsion has still been very much there today. This is not to say that this is the way in which the world ends or the way in which the world is going to be or the way in which the world actually is. This is trying to get an understanding of what has been an immensely powerful and I think quite hidden, um, uh, quite hidden history over the last couple of centuries. We tend to think of the 19th century as the century of progress. That's the, the era of certainty when everyone was certain that we were all steaming ahead and yesterday was not going to be like, uh, tomorrow was not going to be like yesterday. Um, we were going to transform the world in all sorts of new ways. And there is that concept of progress there. But, but, but alongside of that concept of progress, there is also this idea of synchronization and uniformitarianism that we're going to tie ourselves to a single time and we're going to tie ourselves to a single story and essentially we're going to get outside of the flow of time, outside of the flow of history, just in the same way as um, Lyle removed geology and the earth from the flow of geological time, if you like, by saying that really, really the history of the earth was about stasis. Uh, for Charles Lyell, really, really the history of the earth was for every time you get a little bit more land here, you get a little bit more sea there. So it all adds up in the end. So it's a zero sum game. Basically, the, the planet is always logically exactly the same thing. And we're now moving into that same uniformitarian view of, uh, of the world with respect to our own social and natural worlds. So in conclusion, um, I'm going to leave you more with a think piece than anything else. This is my favorite quote from the Mahabharata, uh, one of the uh, great uh, Indian uh, texts. Uh, let me read it and then I'll, uh, I'll comment on it for, its, for a second. The splendid monkey began to laugh and said, Neither you nor anyone can see that form, for that was in, a, in another age that is no more. Time is different in the eon of the winning throw, different in the tray and the juice. This is the age of deterioration, and I no longer possess that form. Uh, this is uh, one of the um, golden age through silver age, through bronze age kind of stories um, associated with Jainism and many religions. Um, earth, rivers, trees and mountains, siddhas, gods and great seers adjust to time from eon to eon, as do the creatures for strength, size and capacity decrease and rise again. Therefore, enough of your seeing that form, sign of Kuru's line, I too conform to the eon for time is inescapable. And Bhima said in response, tell me the number of eons and the manner of each of them, the state therein of law, profit and pleasure, of size, power, existence and death. Now what I've been arguing today is largely, if you like an agreement with this, I'll take out the, um, I'll take out the concept of deterioration, although it's inarguable, um, it's, you could still argue that. But take out deterioration. What you can say is we've had this epoch for the last couple of centuries, basically since the late 19th century, since the Enlightenment period. Um, we've had this epoch um, in which time, our understanding of time, has taken on a particular flavor. Um, there was really no conception like this of uniform time uh, before the, uh, before the um, before the 19th century. There was no conception of a single universal time which was going to work for humans, for plants and animals, for celestial bodies and uh, celestial bodies and glaciers. Uh, but that's the particular flavor of time we have now. And we have a, then that flavor of time uh, is one that's very much tied um, to clock time, to the regular tipping, tipping of, uh, ticking of clock time. Whether that be the time of the computer, whether that be the time that we used to wear on our wrists and is now embedded in our smartphones, uh, whether that be the time through which 
we understand the world. But as we move ourselves and we try to move ourselves, we try to create an economy which is synchronized according to the ideology um, that we've uncovered from the start of the 19th century, um, then uh, we really are very much in that single epoch, in that single eon. And if we're going to move forward as a species, if we're really going to address the Anthropocene in different ways, then troubling our concept of time, thinking about time differently, that is not some kind of a um, rare academic pursuit. It's central to what we should be doing as we think about the world. Thank you.